Hi everyone and welcome to What a Flanker. Now, today's guest is someone that's had a huge impact on uh, my life. His resume speaks for itself, having led England to the uh, World Cup final in 2019, uh, led Australia to the World Cup final in 2003, um, has coached all around the world, uh, England, Japan, South Africa, Australia, to name a few. I talk about him a lot in my new book, What a Flanker. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Eddie Jones. Hask, how are you, mate? Good, boss. How are you? Very well, thanks. I mate. feel like I should have dressed up a bit. You're oh, very I smart, I'd mate. You're very, up for you, mate. You're very smart. We're Penny Hill, mate. You got to look the bit. Well, I get a bold in my like my, my sort of skinny jeans and t-shirt and raised a few eyebrows. Um, now, the reason I wanted to get you on is obviously we interviewed you uh, a little while ago for my other co- podcast, The Good, The Bad, and Rugby. But that was kind of generally about your career and and you as a as a person. And what I wanted to drill down today was a bit about your kind of your coaching style and some of the lessons you've learned over the years, but also some of the stuff that you've you've in, implemented with England, because I know you haven't um, read the book yet, because I haven't got you a copy, because I'm a tired Still waiting for <laughs> still, it, <right>? still waiting <laughs> to sell it. Is that, oh, I was trying to make you pay. Um, is that, I talk a lot about the book, about my experience with you as an England coach, and how, um, you know, and I apologise, he's not blowing smoke up your ass, but this is, this is what we said in the book, and what players feel, that finally England was an environment where, players wanted to be, that it was professional, it was aspirational, and that I felt you had a real balance uh, between the task in hand, but also the people. Whereas in other regimes, I kind of found people were very focused on the task, but forgot that if they don't look after the players, they don't have that bond, that things fall apart. So my first question for you really is, is when did you know you wanted to be a coach? Uh, well, I didn't really, mate. Uh, it all happened by mistake. I was a Randwick hooker, first choice, New South Wales first choice hooker. So there was only two sides in Australia at, the, at that time, New South Wales and Queens there. So you had a fair chance to get in the Wallaby squad. Right. <laughs> anyway, our, our club coach became the Australian coach, Bob Dwyer. He picked the reserve grade hooker from Randwick to be the starting hooker for Australia. So I immediately dropped out. And then, of course, the cascade was that cascaded down to the other teams. So I went from being first choice at the club to being second choice at the club, first choice of being New South Wales, second choice. And and so I went down and played second grade. Um, I was there a couple of weeks and the coach said, Jesus, you talk a lot. You might as well coach the team. Why don't you coach the team? I've heard you use that line on a few people that I've before. So the last six weeks I ended up, you know, not coaching the team, but being quite instrumental. I thought, and we won the comp, so we came from nowhere to win the comp. I thought, this is this is fun, you know. And I was a PE teacher anyway, and I always felt at that stage, the level of coaching you had generally wasn't very good. Um, I thought, I'll, I'll I'll give it a go. Um, and then the game was still amateur, so I coached for a year at the club. We won, um, so I thought, oh, well, if I get the opportunity again. And then my wife said. Well, do you want to stay married or you do you want to be an amateur coach? And I said, oh, no, I'll, I'll stay married. So I stopped coaching and then the game went professional and I got offered a job in, in Japan at a university. Uh, it was half the money I was on in Australia and, and we went there because I just wanted to, to give it a go and you know, it didn't do much good and then it went from there, mate. Did, did Bob Dwyer ever explain why he didn't pick you? Uh, yeah, he just said you're too small, mate. <laughs> well, I, I'm interested because I've seen when when I was doing the research and I, and I, obviously um, your autobiography is uh, out at the moment and it's also coming out in pay, paperback on the 29th of October. I'll give you a plug, you know, not that you need the cash, boss, but <laughs> <laughs> you need to make sure you sell them. Uh, basically, clear the shelf space for my book. Um, but I, mean, I saw the photos in the book and you looked like you were like a bit of a scrapper when you were you, you were younger. I mean, because I we're going to come on to a bit later, but um, about you know. Before I met you, I'd heard about the sort of this this fiery temperament, which I I've luckily I've never I've never seen. Um, so so when you got into the to, to the coaching, did you was it something you were just doing for a bit of fun, or did you really feel that you could like accelerate this on to something when you started taking over in Japan? No, just fun, mate. Just fun. Uh, just love coaching the game. Love trying to make players better. I enjoyed the thing I enjoyed was trying to put a get together a team to play beautiful rugby. You know, it's a bit like Bob used to describe it as being a conductor in an orchestra. You know, when everything's going in the same rhythm, the same time. You know, you know when you're in a team and it seems like it's effort- effortless because yeah. everything's working. You know, when you can achieve that, be part of it as a coach. Because the best thing is to play, isn't it? Yeah. But I'd still love to play now. Yeah. 
but the next best thing is coaching. So trying to trying to get everyone to work together because you know a rugby team is like an orchestra. You've got you've got such different characters, different physical sides, and to get them to all play together the same tune is is uh, a complex situation. Who did you look at as your early early reference points for coaching? Because obviously, I know that you. Um, develop your coaching style all the time. But what were your early references for coaches? Who did you uh, I had Bob Dwyer and another bloke called Jeff Sale. Um, so Bob was was brilliant, ahead of his time, mate. You know, specific training, knew the game. You know, he could tell you in the 41st minute you went down the right-hand side, did you see the support on the inside? He could remember things like that. Uh, and he also was tough, but... <laughs> He made he you knew he cared for you in a funny sort of a yeah, way. Yeah. Whereas we had another coach who all we used to do was play touch football and drink. But you loved him, you know? Yeah. And yeah, he used yeah. to give Jeff Sale, he used to give these speeches. I remember at Could you at Could you Able once he said, This is gonna be like a book, boys. You turn over the first page, we bash them. You turn over the second page, we bash them. You turn over the third page, we bash them. And you but you loved him. Yeah. You know, yeah. And you wanted to play for him. And I think yeah, that's what that's what players want, don't they? They want people who can make them better as a player, yeah. but also care for them. And is that the kind of theme that you've tried to carry on throughout your career? Because what you've just said now is kind of the environment that I came across when I was with England. You know, the caring about the players, the, the fun, but also that you're going to make players better. Did you always achieve that goal or did you go down different paths early on? Well, I think I've always wanted to do that, but sometimes you get distracted. Yeah, you know, I got distracted by by wanting to win too much for a period of time. When I lost that World Cup 2003 final, I was obsessed with winning a big trophy. You know, I thought the game almost owes me one and, and it made me too task-orientated and I was driving the players too hard and not worrying about the other side of it. And for three or four years, you know, when I look back, I lost three or four years of my coaching. As, because you were so desperate to yeah, get the result. Yeah. What what was there a turning point when you realised you'd gone off off that path and you'd sort of maybe just so focused on the, the prize you'd forgotten the relationship and the, the, the fun part of it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was. I coached Queensland in 2008 or 2007 and they'd been a poor team and I didn't make them any better. And But I don't think I coached as well as I could. Um, and when I look back, I would... I could have could have got more out of them by by being uh, gentler on them. Like I was just too demanding of them, and and in the end, you know, when you're too demanding, the tap starts to turn off a little bit. Yeah, right. it's only subtle in in rugby, as you see in football. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fascinating in football. Where you see teams play for one or two seasons. They chase everything, chase hard. You know, run to the back corner, chase back. And then you see after the third season, you see those things drop off a little bit and yeah. they go from first to third. And, and, and to be able to get that little bit more out of players is the key to really good coaching. Because yeah, you, know? you said, you said um, in one of our meetings, you used Leicester uh, as an example when they won the premiership and you showed you know, what, what had happened. Um, do you want to talk me through? Because you sort of were very clear about that. That was a team that had, had played so well and done everything and then become very casual and relaxed. Yeah, well, they, you know, they performed uh, well above themselves, but the next season they couldn't repeat that. And I remember at the time, mate, we were on on that streak. Remember, we were eighteen wins, and I could sense things were starting to unravel. But when you're winning like that, it's very hard for people to understand that. But yeah. I could feel, and I was trying to almost pre mortem what was going to happen, but I I couldn't do it well enough. And in the end, we had to fail a little bit to go forward again. And sometimes you have to do that. And the key, again, to coaching is to make that, that failure period, period as short as possible. And again, it's a, it's a combination of having the right strategy and having the right people in place. Do you think about coaching all the time? Are you ever able to switch off? Uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't find it switching on and off. Like, Fine, okay. Yeah, you know, I... To do something you love doing is is incredible, and like you love doing podcasts because yeah. you love talking. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you love it. You, you sit here, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but, but seriously, and you're good at it. So so why not do it? Um, I not, I don't think I'm good at coaching, but I'm trying to be good at coaching, and I love it, mate. You know, I love thinking 
how can we make this team better? Or, you know, I, I go to the club games and I'll sit there and I'll be thinking, if I was coaching this team, what would I do now? So I don't feel that that's an imposition on me at all. Do, do you feel, because you said you spotted almost like a pre-mortem thing about, about us going to lose, because you're not a player on the field, how how hard do you take it sometimes when you, you know the team's heading for a fall and you're trying your best? Do, do you deal with that well or do you get uptight? I mean, how, how does it express itself? Uh, well, I think experience allows you to deal with it better. When I was younger, I and particularly when I was going through that obsession of winning, I'd, I'd start to blame the players when I look back now. Uh, and now I, I absorb the, the, the responsibility myself, I think, a lot better. And, th- and that's where you see teams rebound quicker, I think, when the coach absorbs that responsibility because at the end of the day you know you were a great player and you know that most players give their best most of the time yeah you know there's very few players I've coached in the period I've coached that haven't given their best there's one or two and you think well I've got to get rid of him but most players give their best so you've just got to create that environment where they want to give a little bit more than that it's amazing to, to hear you sort of you know digest it like that and sort of you know and spot these things did you would you say that period of time when you became assessed was the harshest lesson you learned in your in your coaching career? Uh, yeah, for for sure, mate, for sure. Because uh, you always accept responsibility. Because you know, I think you know, especially in a male dominated sport as we, there's a lot of male ego. You know, it's sometimes you must find it hard when you tell players that they're not good enough or they're not. You know, it, you first reaction is for players to go, well, f- "What the fuck is he talking about? You know, I can do this." Do you find that sometimes hard? Or have learned to be better at that when originally you were like blaming the players, but now I always hear you say in press conferences, "I didn't prepare the team well enough." Was that a, was that a difficult transition to make? Uh, it was a necessary transition to make, and I think the generation of players now it's even more important. Like I think it's I, I love watching the football post game interviews now. You'll see there's a real sameness about what they say. You know, we were amazing today. Our players gave it everything. You very rarely hear a coach say, well, they weren't good enough. You know, there's a real consciousness that that we've got to take the pressure off the players because I think the players are under more pressure today and particularly in this period now, they're even under more pressure because, you know, for young people, it must be quite an anxious time because there's a lot of things being taken away from them. And I think there's a real change in coaching about worrying about the the emotional and cognitive fitness of the players and I think that's the big change in coaching at the moment and I think it's going to get even more I think the big point of difference in coaching is going to be how you can get your players cognitive fit more times than not, than not when is that something you've considered for a while because I think that's the way you work with us certainly since you took over in you know 2016 is that something you've been pretty conscious of uh, yeah more so it probably started in Japan Okay. where I knew I had to – Japan was more about psychologically coaching a team, like changing the narrative of a team that was, that was happy to lose and you had to make a team that, was, that had the courage to win. Um, so I learned a lot about putting everything together, not separating things, because I don't think you can separate the psychology – the physiology, the tactical side, you've got to have it together and all working together. I'll probably come a little bit better at that. Because I, I, I'm intrigued with what you say about the cognitive health of, of, of players. I mean, what kind of things do you do to, to put that in place? Because I know, for example, with me, you would take me to one side or at the beginning of a camp or in a period of time and you would say, do you know how good you could be? Do you know um, this is what I think I need you to do and here's the tools to go and do it? And I think, I don't know, but I think you identified in someone in myself that was prepared to put the hard work in. I just needed some guidance and maybe an arm around me. Is, is that the kind of tactics you use? And what kind of stuff do you do to help with the, the cognitive welfare of the players? Uh, well, we've got to do more and we're not really good at it. Um, but that's the target to get really good at it. Well, I think there's firstly, there's, you've got to come up for a plan for each play. You've got to work out what do they need immediately what will they need when they get to the next stage? Because players, like coaches, go through stages, yeah. you know. So you might come in, you're short of confidence, and then you get too much confidence. So <laughs> yeah. then you've got to wait. How can you catch that ball? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we've got to give you a bit, you know, to yeah. bring you down a bit, then take you up. So it's, 
it's a constant monitoring of the situation, almost like a doctor chem- checking your temperature yeah. of trying to work out where they're going. But, but I think you know, with the younger players now are probably better at managing their technology than your than your age group because yeah, yeah. you sort of got technology thrust upon yes, you. Yes, yeah, and and they didn't always use the data. No, no, and the younger guys now they know when to use their phones because. Yeah, you know, if you spend three hours on your phone before training, you take some cognitive load into that training session. Yeah. And that takes away from your focus, which can cause errors, which can cause mental fatigue. All of that's part of it. It is amazing that you um, you drill down to this. Do you think you're quite unique in, the, in, in identifying the need to know your players individually? Because a lot of coaches I had approached everybody the same. I think the level of coaching is going up and up, mate. And, and again, you see the young coaches coming through. They're much brighter than, than us, um, you know, because they're much better educated, much more aware of all the spectrum of performance parameters at the moment. And and the challenge is to, to try to keep keep being a little bit better. You know, it's the same. Players and coaches are the same, mate. You've got you to get up every morning and, and think about... Um, how you can be a little bit better every day. I read this book, uh, Tiny Habits. I've heard of it. I haven't read Fogg. it. By Fogg. And it's quite an interesting book. And he says, like, get up every day and says, you know, look at yourself in the mirror and, and say, you're going to have a great day and, and do something quite exorbitant to show how excited you are yeah. with the day. So I haven't quite got to that. You're in your pants doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in your pants with a shirt going, Come on! It's going to be a house. great day. Oh, mate, Not quite, but wait, if I get hidden camera and I see you doing shit like that, I can't promise it would put on YouTube. I reckon that'd be viral, mate. I reckon, but, you know, that, if we could sell that video, it might solve all the <laughs> RFU's uh, financial problems. Did um, you know, with this constant desire, kind of to, to develop the, the the way you coach, who do you look at? Are people that you admire and do well? Because you actually go and spend time with other people, don't you? Yeah. Look, just. Uh, read a lot. Um, I think one of, the, one of the great things for me is being audible. I was a, I always read out of books, and now I've gone almost a hundred percent to audible because I can listen an hour every morning in the gym, and so I get through a book in a week. And so you're just picking up. I might read one book, and you pick up one or two different ways of saying things, different approaches, a slightly different idea that just keeps, you've got to keep things fresh. You yeah. know, and particularly young people today. You know, the Apple, you've got Apple Series 5. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure the 6 is coming out. Yeah, yeah. And everyone wants that. As soon as that come out, everyone wants it. Like before you'd get a gold watch when you were 18 and you'd have that the rest of your life. Yeah. Now people are changing watches every six months. And that's how it is. So you've got to keep things fresh. But in the end, you, you're really beating the same drum. You know, work hard, be focused, look after yourself, be the best version of yourself. And you just got to find different ways of, of, of making that fresh, making it exciting and, and capturing the imagination of the, the player's mind. Is it true to say that, um, you know, that through, throughout the whole way you coach, you do have like a set methodology, which is, you know, from observa- observing it, is that you, um, you obviously value the players, you want them to have fun, you want them to learn, you ultimately want them to, to, to win. Do you know, do you see coaches who, who come into an environment and realise what they're, they're doing doesn't work and they try to change it, but because it's not naturally occurring to them, they, they fail? Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, well, I think you've got to know your environment. And I saw a great uh, uh, video on Mourinho the other day and he went to Porto and he's saying, I immediately picked out, like Porto's a, a northern city in, in Portugal, he immediately picked out that this, the fans want a hard-working, grinding team. So he, they were failing and so immediately he had to give the fans what they wanted. And, you know, so you come to every team, you work out, what the team needs, you work out what the fans want, and then you try to put that together in a package. You work out who the key players are, who's going to help you drive this along, who do you, who's going to be the greatest obstacles. And I probably learned that from teaching. Now, the first year I taught, I was a, I think you call it supply teacher here, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine teacher. getting you as a supply teacher. <laughs> Fuck. I'll be like, oh, I wouldn't come into school with it. But you know what happened? Yeah. Because. Because the teachers would take the day off when they had the worst classes. Yeah. So I'd get the, the bottom class of year nine were boys all full of hormones. Yeah. So I'd have them for mass, geography, PE, 
And it, and it was the best way of learning how to control a group because yeah. I'd have to quickly work out, right, how am I going to control this group? Who do I need to quieten down? Who, I, who do I need to befriend? And try to get some sort of uh, something going in the classroom. So that was, that was really helpful for coaching. Because if you can control them, you can control yeah, anyone. Yeah, 100%. Mate. There's some pretty, pretty big children in the English squad sometimes, <laughs> I think. I'm probably the biggest. It's interesting with the, the the different coaches. Is there anyone that you've gone to work with? Because I know you've you sat with Sir Alex Ferguson, haven't yeah. you, uh, Pep Guardiola. Is there anyone that you've, I wouldn't necessarily want you to name them, but you've sat down and thought, I just couldn't do what they do or I don't like their approach. Have you seen that? Or, or, or do most successful coaches have the same similar approaches? Oh, they're all they're all different. Everyone's got their own way, but the principles are generally the same. And I think the good coaches are able to coach to their personality. So, yeah, we've all got a certain traits or characteristics about how we behave. Yeah, and I think all the good coaches understand who they are, yeah. um, and they coach to that. They coach to their strengths rather than trying to be someone else. What would you say your strengths are as a coach? Oh, I don't know, mate. <laughs> um, no, well, I think I've. The one thing I've always tried to do is keep improving. I think oh. that's that's uh, that's pretty important, and, and and I've generally cared about the players a lot. You know, I went through that period, as I said, when I didn't care enough. But I'm a servant to the players. I always see myself as a servant to the players. Do you, you know, because I said earlier about the, the kind of the, the male ego, is there? You can sometimes I feel like go to the, the other way. Like in my career, one of the regrets I had was always wanting to move on to the next thing, never celebrating um, the, the victories, the, the big moments, always being quite harsh on myself. Uh, as you said, you're always very honest about things. Do you still allow yourself time to, to go, actually, I got that right? Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you see when you've done well? Do you see when you've helped people? No, because you never get it right, mate. You're always trying to get it right. And that's, that's how you can stay healthy as a coach. Like you never become a good coach. You're always trying to become a, a good coach. And if you feel that, because... Yeah, we can have a nice podcast now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and the next day we come in, you've had a fight with Chloe. Yeah. She said, I don't yeah. like your book. Again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Throw the book out. Yeah. And you come in in a completely different mindset. Yeah. And then the dynamics of this room will change. Yeah. So then you've got to learn how to handle that very quickly. And it's the same in the team when you've got 30 blokes, you know, that are all, each day they're all different. They all need something a little bit different. But how do you then put your your emotions on hold to consi consistently deliver? Because if you're about a bad day, you then can't, you know, take it out on the on the team. How do you recognise in yourself you do that? Well, do that? sometimes with the coaches, which <laughs> 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 is probably not very healthy. Um, but no, sometimes I deliberately create fights, right, uh, to create the right environment. If I feel things are getting too complacent, I will deliberately try to create a bit of conflict to see where we can go on this, because. At any stage, there's conflicts going on. Like, there's never a beautiful family dinner. You know, yeah. it's not like those American movies, you know, when they sit down, they pass yeah. a chicken around. Yeah. No families like that, no. are they? No. And that's the same with the team. So you've got to be continually looking. And if you haven't got it, you've got to find a way to find it. And when I look back at the World Cup, you know, the mistake I made, and, and, and you know, I'll carry it the rest of my life. I've got a scar there that you can't see at the moment. Yeah. But it's there. <laughs> yeah. That uh, I didn't mind for the conflicts that were there between the semi final and the final. Yeah, I should have gone harder. And it, it was a natural instinct to think, oh, we've done okay here. Even though we had a good preparation, you know. Um, but I, I saw it in that yeah, week. You know? We had a good preparation, but I, I should have dug deeper. You know, in retrospect, I should have dug deeper and, and looked to see what was what was going to stop us from being at our absolute best. The things, what kind of things spring to mind when you're talking about that? Did you go um, into it or not? Well, I, I'm really not sure, mate, to right, be okay. honest. But the one thing I probably should have done, and I've mentioned that previously, is maybe change the order of some players. Um, and I had a great conversation with Macca, and I'm sure he won't mind me sharing this. He was quite upset with what I said. Um, but what I loved about it, he was on enough, honest enough to say it, which is a, a really good sign, yeah. you know, a really good sign. It shows you how much he cares about the team, because um, he thought, I he thought I thought he didn't give his best, but it wasn't that. It was just that sometimes you know the dynamics of the team just need a little bit of a, a change, yeah. and maybe that could have helped them. Maybe not. How you know when you talk about uh, causing a bit of conflict or people being comfortable, 
do, do you have like a master plan? Do you have like a notebook? Are you constantly watching and seeing it and it comes off the top of your head and how you sense it straight away or, or is a lot of your stuff considered in, in terms of some of the things you do? Uh, well, most of it comes on the cross trainer in the morning, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Uh, so I'll wake up, have a look at the day, see what's ahead, and then I'll go on the cross trainer and and not be intentionally thinking, but your best thoughts generally come at that time and then something will come up, right, I need to attack this. And then I'll go back to my office, uh, come up with a plan, call whatever staff I need to come in or call a player in and then have a chat about it. And sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong. Now, it's a bit like rolling the dice at the casino. But it, I just think it's amazing because I, I, I've said before, for example, in some of your press conferences, when, you, when you've said things and the, the British media's got so excited, the fans got so excited, that I've a lot of time have identified that you are, are saying things for a particular reason that I know you to be a very considered person. Like I, you know, even after I've seen you had a couple of red wines, you know, it always comes with this glass. <laughs> you never, you never, you know, you never oh, yeah. change that kind of um, the ability to be switched on and everything else. It, it's amazing that I don't think people appreciate that you are considered in these actions that you don't do anything without thinking about it. Is that fair to say? Uh, generally speaking, I can get agitated at a press conference. Yeah. So I lost it with that one about Bruce Craig. Yeah. But I had that line in my head and I thought it was a good line. It's a fucking great line. <laughs> and I wanted to use it. And then someone really uh, got under my skin at the press conference and said, oh, why not? I'm going to get into trouble. So I might as well go for it. <laughs> well, I, but I think, it, I think do, you know what, do, you, do you understand that players love that as well from you, that when their coach goes to bat for them? Well, I think in England it's even more important, mate. I think because the media is so influential here, more so than probably any other country, because it's, you know, you've got so many papers, you've got so many talk shows, you've got, and, and with that comes probably more social media. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but it probably does. So therefore, the players need support, mate. They need to be supported, which goes back to, you know, what we were talking about, how the football coaches talk now. What tactics, when you t took over England, did you have a preconceived idea of what you wanted to do with us, the tactics you were going to use as a coach? Well, I didn't know the players. Like, you know, the only guy I knew was you. Um, so you've got to get to know the players. But I immediately picked up a, a sense that they needed confidence. Yeah. That, you know, the 2015 had been a traumatic experience for most players and that, so I had to come in and give them something to to grab hold of, which was just very simply playing in the style of rugby. You know, yeah. we, as you know, we didn't talk about culture. We didn't talk about rules. We didn't talk about anything. You know, this is how we're going to play. This is how we're going to train. If you're on board, stay stay there. If you're not, you can hop off, boys. And and so it was nice and clear and simple and allow players to just, just get on with it. And again... That had a period of life and then we had to have a uh, a reset and go again, which we which we managed to do. How important are the, the support staff and, and coaches to, to implementing what you do? You know, because obviously you must have to carefully pick them to know that they're gonna complement you and also be able to deliver your, your methodology. Yeah, like the first three coaches we had, yeah, you had Steve who's massively analytic, um, you know, serious, yeah. dour. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, players love him because yeah. they know he's gonna, he's going to do and the he cares. right. Yeah, he yeah, cares a lot in his own way. Yeah. Then you got Guzzy, who's the showman. You yeah. know, he's the greatest showman on earth. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, cares for the play. And then you had Hats, who's like the pie man in the middle, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, 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 nice and solid, delivers the pies every week. Yeah, yeah. Good guy, Eats you know. He's still eating a few now. I, I think. bet he is. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a nice combination. So what you try to do is create a, a coaching team where there's someone for for every player. Yeah, that's the key. And then and then I've got to try to come in and. and can add some some value to that, how, but how conscious was that to have ev something for everyone? Because I talk about it in what a flanker is that you can have a coach like yourself at the top who's directing things, who's clearly in charge. But if you have another four alpha males, yeah. where's the compassion? Where's the cognitive understanding? Yeah. Where do you go to have a word? Because you've got forty players who are going through different emotions, and some people react differently. And I've had England setups where you've had. People you just couldn't uh, couldn't approach was yeah. that a really conscious thing to yeah, get that no, balance 100%. right? Yeah, hundred percent. And then, as you know, brought in people like Glenn. Yeah, yeah, you know, he's the nicest bloke in the world. Yeah. Calm, considered, gentle—the exact opposite of me. Um, so, 
he again acts as a nice balance. Um, so you got to continually think about that because, generally speaking, players need someone who they can be close to. I yeah. think you know need someone, and the head coach is because of selection is always a little bit further back, whereas the assistant coaches have got to be much closer to them. You know, when I, when I watched um, The Last Dance, I, I said out of all the coaches I'd ever worked with, I felt you were, you know, most like kind of Phil Jackson in terms of the, the ability to, A, bit, have a unique style, B, kind of deliver um, uh, a style that you, that you wanted, but also not be intimidated by, by characters. I mean, how important do you find having characters and difference of opinion are in a squad? Uh, look, you need characters in life, don't you? You know, if you're walking down the street and you see people misbehaving or, or full of life, it immediately changes your behaviour. Um, and it's the same in a team. You need lively characters. You need solid... It's a bit like the coaching staff. You need solid characters. You need analytical characters. You need that balance. And, and one of the hardest things now is because of the almost methodical process of producing rugby players those characters are finding it harder to get through. Yeah. I mean, because I, I, I just think it's interesting. You better start breeding, mate. Hey? <laughs> mate, yeah, don't tell Chloe. I think, she, I, think, I think she's key for that at the moment. Um, obviously, I think you, 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 you touched on the, the, the importance of the characters. What kind of stuff do you implement to keep the balance between being very serious but also boys having a good time? Because I think some people lose that in, in, their, in their coaching style. They, they could become so tense, but you seem to always drive standards on the field, but also want the guys to have a good time off the field as well. Yeah. Well, I think, again, it's a balance. Um, like, the one thing you can never change is your standards on the field because the game, game finds you out. If you don't train correctly, you don't train at the right intensity, you don't train with the right focus, the game exposes you. And what you want to do off the field is then provide a supportive environment for the team. And I've got that wrong. You know, on a number of occasions, I've got that wrong. Experience has probably taught me now to be less controlling in that area and give more responsibility to the players. And I think particularly these days, it's more important that the players take control of that area rather than the coach driving. Like, you know, in the old days, the coach would be the energy of the team. You know, he'd drive what happened on the field, he'd drive what happened off the field. Now I think it's it's much more important the coach sets the standards on the field, decision making is driven by the players, and then off the field you allow the players within that framework to operate. Do you find it interesting that a lot of the relationships in rugby and professional sport are very much teacher pupil? That you know, you know, you've always you're always my boss. You know, I you've encouraged um, people to have a difference of opinion. But it's sometimes quite hard to actually get that in a squad, you know, for people to actually stand up and say, do you know what, boss, I think we should do this a little bit differently. You use some quite unique tactics within them, getting people in to have difficult conversations. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think, you again, you've just got to create an environment where, where players can feel they can be themselves. You know, what ultimately you want is each player to be the best version of themselves. And, and sometimes you've got to bring external people in to, to open up the environment. Sometimes you've got to bring inspirational people in. Sometimes you've just got to spend more time one-on-one -on -one with players to work out what they need. But you want them to be the best version of themselves. Again, you want... The greatest, the greatest quote I've ever heard about making a team was the Italian football coach, Lippi. I think he won the 92 World Cup. And he said, a coach's job is to instill his personality on the team but not annul the personality of the individual. And to me, that sums it up brilliantly. You know, you want the team to play with your spirit. Yeah. But you want the players to be themselves. Now, now everything you said, it sounds to me like you obviously have like an incredible amount of, like, of self-awareness and understanding. Like you said, you never feel the job's done. You're always constantly developing. You're able to reflect. But that's not always easy for men to do, especially, you know, uh, with the male ego being what it is. Do you have like a sounding board? Is there people that you would say, for example, because sometimes you can't, the expression, you can't see the wood for the trees. Is there someone you would reach out to to get some honest feedback and opinion? Yeah, I've, I've been lucky, mate. I've got uh, a mate I went to university with. Uh, he was the brightest bloke in the class. Like we do a biology test. I've been there for two hours. He'd know how to get 51 out of 100 and be out in 45 minutes. 
and he was from a gambling family, big horse racing family, and just a good bloke, you know. But he'd stand, sit, stand in a room and he could sense what things were happening. So I've always used him as a bit of a, if I've got a problem, you know, I'm having this problem with Haskell, you know, he can't catch the ball. What am I going to do? <laughs> Doesn't here? sound like me. <laughs> it must be someone else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he just like, he, he'd give me an idea. And then I've had uh, David Pembroke, who's who's a long time associate from the Brumbies, just a great ideas man. You know, he got good ideas, got crap ideas, but got plenty of ideas. And he's a real, we, ha we have like quite, vigorous discussions you know we'll have shouting matches but we'll put the phone down he'll he'll tell me where to go or i tell him and then we'll ring up the next day and we we start again and he's he's a brilliant theorist um and then i now i'm lucky i've got neil craig who's you know just a doing a coaching again one of those blokes that sits in a room and, and senses what's going on because it it is amazing. It's one of my New Year's resolution kind of things was, was to have more difficult conversations. And it's intriguing that you can have these conversations with people and sort of get heated, but then take the emotion out to remember to do a job. I mean, do you, do you find that hard or are you quite good at doing that? Uh, no, no. Because one of the things I've... And I was, I, was, I was lucky, I think, from my parents. I never carry a grudge. So if we have a difference, then that difference is... Once we've discussed it, it's done. That's there's, quite rare, you know. That, yeah. yeah, that you can't. There's nothing else you can do no, with that. No. Yeah, you know, and I and I was lucky because my parents had quite a tough upbringing, so I think they had to endure a fair bit, and they never carried grudges. And I think that's a nice thing to have. And yeah, you, know, you know, obviously, you know, things happen uh, where people say hurtful things, but why carry a grudge? Because it's not going to fix what they said. No. It's what you do after that. How do you manage people who, who, who don't take it as well? Because I can imagine with staff, because I know, I know interestingly enough, what, what you said about is sometimes causing conflict. I imagine that just like the players, the staff, you have to keep driving them to maintain their standards. And sometimes support staff who might not be frontline can get quite comfortable. And I imagine sometimes you probably threw a few pins out of yeah. some grenades and threw it in there. But not everyone takes it like you do and can't have difficult conversations. How do you manage that kind of stuff? Uh, well, you got to deal with that one-on-one -on -one with right. the with the person, and then I've also now I've got Neil Craig who'll go in and be like, you know, the Hen keeper. Henry Kissinger, <laughs> the mediator, sort things out. So, so you send so Craigie's the, the you know, <laughs> Craigie's the, the the patsy that you yeah. send in when you bollock everyone. Um, within the England squad, I think there's a real like uh, mix of of diversity. Um, you know, you said about obviously the different characters. Do you it feels to me sometimes that you also you like to harness the individuality of those players. You know, like your Genjis, like your you know, like your Sinclair. Sinclair, I think, thinks he was possibly born on the streets in, in you know, involved in an actual drive-by at the time. But I think he was from Epsom, isn't he? I don't you know, but he likes to play up on that. Right. How how do you how do you encourage that diversity and how important do you think that is to a team? I, I don't know whether I encourage it, but it's just I like players that have got a bit about them, like. You remember that 2016 tour we took Genji and Sinclair? You yeah, know, they yeah. both played like four or five premiership games. Yeah. You remember every training session they want to fight someone. Yeah. You know? And we endured that, let them go, let them find their own way. And look at them now. You know, Sinclair's a lion. Uh, he'll become the best tight head in the world. Genji will keep progressing. You know, you can see now he's, he's getting mature all the time, even playing for Tigers now. Like, could you imagine three years ago Genji captaining the Tigers in the game? No, it's amazing. It's, a, it's incredible, mate. So you've got to look for those guys because it's, it's, you want people who've got plenty of fight in them because you can always dampen down the fight. The hard thing is putting fight into people. Do you find it, um, do you always roll your eyes when you when you make selections and you choose these players like a and a Sinclair because you sort of have a master plan, but the media and the fans are like, they don't understand why you haven't picked the obvious, where perhaps the obvious doesn't have the characteristics you want? Yeah, again, experience teaches you not to even worry about it i don't even i don't i hear it because people tell me but i don't read it i don't take it into consideration you've got to be quite clear what you want and you know i go to club games and i know what i'm looking for and and i can be wrong you know i've made plenty of bad bad decisions you know i dropped you at one stage that must have been a bad decision <laughs> mate I thought you'd retire me <laughs> one day. So, you know, you make bad decisions, yeah. but you get on with it. But I know what I want. 
But I mean, how often do you sort of sit sit back at yourself and go? I mean, I know that you don't necessarily self congratulatory, but how how often are you self analytical? Is it is it just a constant process through the day? Because or is it like you said on the cross train in the morning where you think I did this yesterday, did that work? Is it, or, or are you constantly looking for feedback from people? Because I know as a a player, I would want to get feedback, and I know if I came to see you. I would get I would get honesty, yeah. but where does a coach get honesty from? Oh, you got to get it from yourself because right. okay. most people won't tell you. Uh, Neil does. Yeah. Uh, my mum does. Uh, she'll still ring me up and she'll say, "Have you shaved this morning?" She's ninety five. Like, <laughs> you think she'd have more things to worry yeah. about? That's all my mum. Every time, all my yeah. mum says to me, "Oh, I saw you. You know, you didn't have the beard." Do you know what she said to me once? She goes, you're growing your beard out. You know, the reason Eddie hasn't pictures, you, you think she's so old, he's mentioned it already. <laughs> Shave your beard down. As if you were going to go, fucking hell. But actually, bizarrely, I did trim it up and you went, yes, mate. You're looking younger. I was like, fucking hell, mum. Mum knows. Mum knows. Mum knows. But yeah, so so, so that you've got those kind of people who will be yeah. very honest with yeah. you. Um, with, with that, on that topic, it, with player empowerment, so you have some environments where, and I think you've said you, you were perhaps like that in a period, very... Uh, very much like a dictator you set the tone you manage everything then you've talked about having uh, player empowerment where do you think the sweet spot is where where players need to to be involved and stand up and where do they where does the coach still need to, to be in charge well you never know it's different for every group you know so if you look at our England side now from where we started to where we are now it's changed considerably players have much more input much more responsibility and and given things are equal over the next period of time, by the time we get the next World Cup, you know, I should be almost be able to sit in a in a, a nice lilo on the on the pool. But you'll never do that, will you? But but that's where we want to get to where the team's operating by themselves. And you see the great teams, you know, they operate generally by themselves. The coach is there, gives them a little bit what they need, sharpens them up at times, but the team operates by itself. But when you start with the team, yeah, you know, you've got to be driving, you've got to be directing, you've got to be energising. And so you go through this and sometimes you've got to go back to go forward. Yeah, you know, it's never a straight line. But that would probably come after potentially some, some failure yeah. as well, where you would you would dissect. Yeah. Because yeah. is it fair to say that after every campaign, you you go through a complete process of dissection of everything? Yeah, yeah. Probably not a, not to the detail that, that people think that. Um we don't delve into data too much. We, we've we got some really key data we look at. Um, but the main thing is always trying to find out, and I was taught by a doctor back in, back in Australia, what's going to make the biggest bang for your buck? What are the three things that are going to make the biggest bang for your buck? Identify them and then work out whether it's practical to improve them. So we might have three months to the next campaign. So is improving speed practical? No, so don't do it. Is improving aerobic fitness practical? Yes. Improving the way we more? Yes, for instance, you know, as yeah. an example. So you're getting a double figure on, on what's important and then whether it's practical and then it's just picking out those three th- things and driving them forward. Because I can remember I can remember after after campaign and finish, you guys obviously have re- review meetings and talk about everything and then, you know, I might... I might speak to you in the following weeks and you would be like, you know, our speed and the breakdown is just, is just not good enough. Um, you know, our ex- you know, and that would be the focus for that period yeah. of time. Would, was there any common themes that with this England side that keep coming up that you that would always flag up every time? That- uh, no, you know, we, we've, the game's changing now though, and we're going to have to change pretty quickly over the next period of time. Um, but we were pretty solid in, in all the basics of the game because Test match rugby is basic. You know, it's not sophisticated rugby. It's hard physical rugby where you got to give the best players the opportunity to be, to be, to to do what they do good at, and that's what that's when New Zealand have been historically successful. It's a tough forward pack that goes forward, then give the ball to the backs in space. You know, and and the game is obviously more complex, but that's the simplicity of the game. England tends to be more of a rumble, doesn't it? You know, mm. let's rumble a bit more, and then then we'll see what we can do. And and we haven't gone too far away from that. But the game is changing a little bit, and we might have to change that. Talk about change. There's so much data now um, surrounding us, so many camera angles, so much information. Do you think coaches are losing their way, relying too much on that? Because you just said that you don't rely that, that heavily on, on on data. 
again, you know, before you had to really work to be a coach. You know, you had to go and, like, I had to go to Japan and coach on a, a baseball field, dirt baseball field. They had 100 kids, 100 kids every afternoon, six days a week. Just you and 100 kids? Yeah, just, oh, God. It, was, it was, mate, it was the best way to learn how to coach. And I had to learn how to coach that way. Now, guys tend to specialise early on. You yeah. know, you become a line-out coach or you become a scrum coach and that's the only thing you do. So they lose that that whole connectedness of the game, which might, again, relate to to their observation skills. With um, with a lot of the stuff now, do you, you kind of the mental side of stuff is so is so important. Do you think that's an area that's neglected? Because I, I said it in, in the water flanker, I, I, I said a lot of... Rugby is, is, is used as reliance, reliance on data and kind of um, equipment and technology and nutrition. But the one thing that seems to be left behind is the mind. And, and you were probably the only coach that I ever worked with that did scenario-based training. Do you think that's an area that's really neglected still with players? In their uh, I think it's improving massively in in, uh, in rugby. Um, but there's still a, it's probably the biggest growth area. Because just look at... Yeah, what was the difference between us in the semi-final and us in the final? What was the difference between Saracens in the quarter-final against Linz and semi-final against Racing? You know, to be at to be at that physical edge where you're feeling like you want to go, um, to be able to capture that more consistently is the key, and it's it's not only it's the physical and mental together. Uh, uh, what kind of things do you think team, more teams need? Psychologists, do you think it's, it's an individual thing that players need to look at? Because from age of 17 to 35, I spoke to someone, and I reckon if you put your hand up in the room and asked how many people dealt with psychologists when we started, probably maybe two. I know you had them around the team, but sometimes they still kind of can be on the periphery. Yeah, no, 100%. I think that's the real growth area, mate. Yeah, I, I can remember when I played, which is a long time ago, I went to a, I got picked for Sydney, right? So it was the first time I ever got picked. Went to a training session and I had to throw the ball. My hands were sweaty. I was that nervous because it was full of wallabies. I couldn't throw the ball. So I went home. I thought, I've got to do something about this. I went, out, I went and bought the inner game of tennis, which was like one of the foundation sports psychology, and read it and then came up with a way of controlling my mind. And I actually met the guy, Timothy Galway, not long ago. And so players now wouldn't do that. No. Not because they're not educated, not because uh, they're, not, they're not industrious, but because things are done for them. And I think that a good performance psychologist encourages the players to develop their own routines because it's about getting in that routine to be mentally stable. Well, and that's going to become even more important, mate. When you came into the squad, you I remember you asked everyone to put their hand up and say, uh, who was self-reliant? Who was self-resilient? And, you know, I, I think there was probably three people in the gym uh, room that you would have given that to. I don't know if you would have given it to me, but I, I gave myself as well, just purely because of, you know, the, the reach out for psychologists, yeah. leaving no yeah. stone unturned yeah. in the pursuit of trying to be, be good. If you were to ask that question now in the squad, is that dramatically changed now in terms of how, how especially this lockdown period, I remember <coughs> you saying on our podcast, you were so impressed with the dedication and focus people had. Yeah, I think it's on a more positive curve. But the, 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 the big jump will come, as you said, in players understanding how they think and taking responsibility. Don't be reliant on the environment. Take responsibility yourself. Like, how does a Federer keep improving? Like, how old is he now? 36. Yeah. Keeps improving. It's incredible, hey? Imagine if... Rugby players all had that, like a Carter. Yeah. Like Carter played his best World Cup at 35, plays for racing, then goes to Kobe for two years, plays unbelievable rugby when he doesn't have to, you know, because he's still going to get paid. Yeah. But he, he wants to win and wants to keep getting better. And there's not, there's not one player in the world who can't get better in that area. And that's the most exciting thing. Because, you know, he, he actually said in an interview that he wished he'd got to sports psychology earlier. Yeah. That it's one of the lessons he had. And I talked to Johnny Sexton about it. It's something he came came to late. Do you ever sit down with players and go, you've got everything, but you just haven't got it upstairs? In a nice way. In a, <laughs> yeah. But, what, but what, what, how much how much like space and time do you give them? Because you look at them and go, all the raw materials are there, but you just clearly haven't got your head on. You're just not doing what needs to be done. Did you give them a period of time? Do you steer them in the right direction? How do you deal with that? Because it must yeah. be really frustrating for you. Yeah, well, it just it depends on a number of factors. On firstly, the players' desire to get better. If they're committed to get better, 
but they're struggling to find the way you'll give them a bit more time. If a player's indifferent to that, then you'll tend to be shorter time. The competitive tension that's in that area, you know, have they got someone pushing them um, that can take their spot straight away? Yeah, because we're an in-and-out team, aren't we? Yeah. You know, we're not a settled family team. We're a competitive uh, monster that you either compete and you're in and you're doing well, a bit like Netflix, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you're either doing well, you're not doing well, you're out. Um, and you have to develop that mentality of how you're going to be at your best all the time. Did you did you listen to that Netflix documentary about that, about that uh, or podcast, about the way that they do things? No, I've just started reading the book. Well, yeah, because yeah. it's amazing that yeah. they basically... You know, I remember there was the, the team that basically converted them to, to online, and then one day they didn't have a job anymore, and yeah. they and they said to them, "Well, what's happened?" They went, "Well, we we found people who can do what you do better. Yeah. Thank you very much for all you've done, mm-hmm. but that's it." Um, obviously, professional sport is a little bit diff- is, is slightly more different because you have um, the emotional bonds, but I suppose you're quite comfortable with the fact that you've just got to keep putting the right elements in to get the best out of it, and you sort of have to put your emotions on hold a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know. Players will fluctuate in performance. No one can play at nine out of ten every game. So you've got, you've got to trust the players. As long as they they've got that desire to keep improving, then you you allow that. You know the thing. The, the big thing for me is when they start dropping off, and you can see that. You know you go to the gym. They're not working hard in the gym. They're sitting around having a laugh. They come to a meeting and they're not quite. You know you can see in their eyes they're not quite there. They you know they cut it cut a corner at training, you see all those little bits and pieces, you know, these things stand the test of time of why players, of, of giving evidence of how players drop off. It must be exhausting being in your head analysing that all the time. Do you, do, you, do you find it really sort of, you know, overwhelming at times or, or just because you enjoy it, it's not a problem? No, no, I enjoy it. I think, yeah, you know, one of the things I'm lucky is that I don't have a lot else in my life. No, it's, it's true, and that's allowed me to keep coaching. I was speaking to uh, a rugby league coach, a coach for a long time, and I said, how have you managed to stay at the top? And he said, well, I've just got rugby league and my family, mate. And, it's, and, and if you keep focused, then I don't have a lot of other things to worry about. Fine. So I Except love it, which, mate. you know, new trainers and, and you, know, <laughs> you know, a few cash jobs on the side. Um, do you... Obviously, apart from the big things like wanting to win a World Cup, how often do you do you personally set goals? Like, because I, I can imagine that you know you, you want to, for example, come into Six Nations, you want it to be super successful. But do you have do you have constant set yourself personal milestones? Yeah, no. Every three months, I write a program. So I write a program of what I want to achieve. And what would that look like? What kind uh, of things? So it might be so. The last period of time in the lockdown, I wanted to really investigate selection policies. So. I went out and met uh, the guys from Red Bull. I spoke to Ed Smith at uh, England Cricket. I spoke to Justin Langer just about how their approach to selection picked up one or two things. So I set professional goals. Personal goals are generally more about just keeping fit and yeah. healthy and then giving as much time to the family as they need. That is so interesting that you, that you do that. And so, so once you... It's sort of the goals that ultimately are going to affect the bigger picture stuff, yeah. so like the selection... I didn't. I didn't know that. How, I've got a couple more questions because I know we haven't got you for, for for too much longer. But one of the things that, with an ever changing squad and the fact that you create an aspirational environment, where I think England sides beforehand, I talk about in the book, you'd get um, selected and there'll be that initial excitement, and then you would think, "Fuck, I'm going to go to Penny Hill. It's going to be, you know, mindless training. It's going to be whatever, and I'm not going to necessarily enjoy myself." How do you, with the sort of in and out stuff, do you breathe that loyalty and, 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 and excitement? Is it the balance of, of, of making it fun and everything or, or, or have you got any secrets to that? Well, well I think, firstly, you've got, to, you've got to get the players to understand this is, this, is like, this is high performance and high performance is not comfortable. But it's a bit like, high performance is a bit like sitting in a sauna, isn't it? Like when you're in the sauna, it's not very comfortable, is it? No. But you get out and you feel fantastic. You have a shower, you feel fantastic. And that's a bit like high performance. You've got to work hard to get there. And then when, when you've finished and you've done the job, then you feel fantastic. So it's almost like, you know, today everyone wants to be happy all the time. So there's like a fun number one. And the fun number two is high performance, where you work hard and you get, you get your rewards at the end of it. So firstly, they've got to understand that. Secondly, all good players want to test themselves. You know, they want to be the best, you know. 
So Slady comes in from XD, he wants to be better than JJ, he wants to be better than Owen. So they're competing. So you've got that in the best players, you've always got that. So you, you want to keep that, that always pour a bit of fuel on that fire to keep them competing. And then thirdly, you've got to try to tie them together into a certain purpose. So they know they're doing it for a reason. And, you know, it was after the last World Cup, the 2015 World Cup, it was to put pride back in England rugby. And now, you know, we've come up with this goal where I know we've been criticised saying we want to be the greatest team in the world, but why not? Why, yeah. why, why do we train hard, work hard if we don't want to be that? But, but we had Dylan Hartley on and he he said that you um, changed the, the d- dynamic by the way the team spoke about itself because we used to read off pre-scripted media sheets. We would never talk about ourselves. We'd never talk about winning. But you saw it as something that could immediately change overnight. I think Dylan needed a pre-script for that book, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. You know, I met him after he met you. He was shitting me because he called me up. I said to Dylan, how was Eddie? And I went, if we need to get rid of the body. Because he, he, was, he was telling me he was going to have to dig a hole. If you attacked him, we were just going to have to get rid of the body and say that Eddie never made it to the, to the home. Um, but yeah, but did, did you, was that something you saw straight away with the England, this England team a sort of talking about themselves in not positive terms and not used, utilising that winning language. Well, I don't think they control the narrative. You know, generally in each week, the England side together, there'll be a story. Like, so when we play against Italy, the story will be that, that you've got to win by 50 points. Otherwise, you haven't done the job. And what you've got to try to do is create the right narrative for your team, not the, not the narrative that the media want. Because the media either wants something extraordinary good or extraordinary bad yeah yeah and that sells doesn't it yeah. that sells yeah. that's good it's like podcasts yes yeah, exactly. you're either going to be very good or very bad yeah. you could just admit you've got a drug <laughs> problem on here that would be, that'd be really good yeah so so you're trying to create that right narrative for the team to operate do you find it um hard that normal people don't get this about um the fact that the the, the media create a narrative that for example high pressure environments high pressure coaching environments are uncomfortable because I know, I know after the, the loss against France, well, I think we we talked about this on on the phone. You know, I'm obviously, um, you know, I have a, I have a, a large amount of loyalty for for, for to, towards you, and I and I respect what you do, and I, I think hopefully this podcast will shed a light on your constantly thinking. A lot of stuff is 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 very well thought out, but it must be frustrating when people level stuff against you and say, oh, you know, gone to a number of coaches, gone to a number of players. Because the, the honest truth is, is that this stuff isn't always fun and that you some people just aren't good enough. But you, it's hard to turn around and tell people that or tell the media that so-and-so just doesn't fit. Yeah. You kind of have to skate, skate round it. Ah, it's not really an issue, mate. Is it not? No, don't worry about it at all. Fine, okay. Because yeah. I, just, I just wondered when you know, I, I sit down and, 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 and get asked about something, say for example, Eddie Jones has said this, or what's this like? Or someone will say to me, you know... Uh, it's gone to a different number of coaches and I'm like because perhaps they weren't the best for the job perhaps they didn't realise what it took to be a high level because I think people want the success like you said it before people want the fast car people want the hot girlfriend people want the nice house but they're not prepared to do what it takes yeah. to get there uh, and I just wondered if that was an, it was an area of frustration for you but obviously you probably don't give it another thought no it, well, you can't let those things you can't control worry you otherwise they do become a burden on you so to wrap up finally, what, what would you say are your kind of next ambitions? For you, I think, in a coaching point of view, but also with, the, with this England team. I want us to play a game that everyone remembers the rest of their life. So I don't think we already did that against New Zealand. Oh, but we can do better, Fine. mate. Okay. And so everyone's sitting there with a big smile on their face. So imagine the whole of England, 60 million people sitting there with a smile on their face. They've just seen this incredible game of rugby played by these incredible players. And then, so we want to keep doing that consistently because yeah. you want to be one of those teams where, you know, guys go down to the pub or have a cup of coffee and they say, who's the best team you've ever seen? Do you remember that England side? Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that England, like Farrell captain, you know, Daly at the back, Watson down the wing, May, he was, he was a different character. Runs the, yeah. the stand or something, <laughs> something like that, yeah. But, they, they, you know, that's what you want to be part of, don't yeah. you? And then you really change people's lives. Because the great thing about players, they have an opportunity to not only change their lives, but change other people's lives. You know, because a lot of people, people live on England games. Like, you know, just going down the gym here, a guy comes in, he says, 
I haven't been at Twickenham for eight months. It's killing me. It's killing me. Yeah, because that's the highlight. Because people, people, yeah. people um, project onto sports yeah, because 100%. they don't necessarily come to with their own lives. They don't like their nine to five job. They live yeah. through that team. And you're right. We, I suppose we have a responsibility to do that. And, and if we go well, we can we can change everything. But what a great responsibility to have. Yeah. They? So to be part of that's fantastic. And then we get to the World Cup and we keep playing well. What would you say uh, to to a young Eddie Jones coach? What would you say to to him? If you could improve on anything or do anything or give a bit of advice. Uh, be patient. As a coach, any young coach is out there, be patient. Just learn your craft. And finally, um, is there still the burning desire to, to, to win that trophy uh, or the, a big trophy, like you said, like a World Cup? Or have you gone past that? Are there other sort of personal things you want to achieve? You know, is, are you going to finish with England or is there more to come? Because obviously, as you said, you're, you're still getting better. There's always more to come, mate. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, look, uh, look, we'd love to win the World Cup, but we're not. That's not going to be the a- a- absolute goal for us. We want to keep getting better. We want to play that perfect game of rugby where everyone's eyes light up. Do you think you'll ever stop? Uh, eventually, I think there's always a. I don't think your wife wants you to stop. <laughs> no, you no, you sitting around the house <laughs> taking up gardening, you probably end up trying to be the best gardener in the world. That's one thing we've never done, mate. Ever since we bought a house in Sydney, we had a garden, and we vowed after that house we'd never buy another house in a garden. Really? Because yeah. it's just another thing <laughs> no, that gets in the way. It's another thing. Another to worry responsibility about. <laughs> you don't need: coaching, family, no gardening. Exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, what a flanker with um, legendary England coach and, and, and probably the best coach I ever worked with, Eddie Jones. Now, his autobiography um, is out in paperback on the 29th of October. It's out now as well as a hardback. Eddie, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate Pleasure, it. Pleasure, mate. Um, thanks for coming on for free because I don't think we could <laughs> afford your, your fee. Um, I'm James Haskell. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, and please do, please share, please leave some feedback, good or bad, uh, and I'll catch you very soon. Thank you.